Hi there. So this week has got a bit of a theme around animals, I suspect, might be coming up in one form or another. Um, and animals have been quite a feature of the lockdown, I think, with city types like me discovering all sorts of creatures in their gardens. Um, the goldfinches have been like angels sent from above um, as we've sat in our garden. We've had a whole flock actually of goldfinches now live in our back garden in southeast London, um, which is wonderful. But the most startling thing of the week have been these peregrine falcons that have uh, nested. Now the fledglings have hatched on the spire of the church um, just opposite us, um, St Giles Camberwell. It's a neo-Gothic um, uh, Victorian church with these wonderful gargoyles. So the, the falcons nesting and grabbing pigeons from the sky and then feeding the screeching fledglings has been a tremendous thing this last uh, week or two. Uh, um, sort of giving us a, a new boost of animal fascination even as lockdown comes to an end. I hope you can see them there. Someone, a friend of St Giles takes these wonderful photos. Um, and if you think about animals and you think about philosophy, you might think many, many things, but certainly for someone like me, it takes you back to Aristotle, who in many ways, you know, was the greatest philosopher on animals because he was one of the greatest early biologists um, amongst everything else that he did. Um, and uh, I was looking up and he really is quite remarkable what he's given us, actually. So you, one way of tracking it is just by the words that we have that came either directly from Aristotle or came out of Aristotle's work. So for example, the word species um, is an Aristot Aristotelian coinage. He talks about energy for the first time, physiology, quantity, analysis. He gave the sense of axiom, categories, mechanics, organic, physics, botany, the sense that we use them now. Um, many names came out of his work. He was the tutor of Alexander the Great in the fourth century um, BC. And so when Alexander the Great went on his mad rampage halfway around the world, one of the upsides of that was that he would send Aristotle back lots of examples of fauna and flora, as well as everything else that um, his armies came across. And Aristotle would study them and named them with the names that either he or his pupils um, gave them that we still use now. So just amongst the flowers, aconite, balsam, balm, box, cherry, chestnut, chicory, heliotrope, marjoram, etc, etc. All these names go all the way back to that time as well, which is rather wonderful giving depth um, to our current experience. Um, his method was pretty um, basic in a way, but hugely productive. And I think in some ways um, that's why he um, speaks to us now, because the, the scientific method too, um, you might say in some ways, um, is uh, very basic, but hugely productive. Um, I mean, I'll bow to what Lucy might say about this later on, but certainly Aristotle's method is basically gathering loads of examples and then trying to categorize things, hence coining the word category. And it didn't just work for animals, but it worked in politics too. So for example, Aristotle's um, search parties would go out, gather examples of political constitutions, the way that city-states and small countries organized themselves. And he organized those into groups and so came up with the famous threefold way of organizing politics, um, which was a monarchy where one rules, um, an aristoc aristocracy where a small group rules, and then a democracy where everybody in principle rules. Um, but what's so interesting about this categorization is it's also really productive. So for example, his work on politics told him that monarchy might be great, but it can also flip into tyranny, when instead of the one person ruling for the many, they rule for themselves. Similarly with an aristocracy, if there's a small group ruling for the many, it can work quite well. But when they start ruling for themselves, it flips into what he calls an oligarchy. And then similarly, perhaps most pressingly for us now, he foresaw the dangers of democracy, that it can work fine and well when everyone is, as it were, ruling for the best interests of everyone else but it can quickly flip into what he called timarchy, a more kind of mob rule, where people turn against each other and the power to the people um, turns poisonous and becomes a, a vicious spiral down rather than a virtuous spiral up. Um, so simple method, hugely productive um, and still very relevant to us now. Um, 
he could certainly make mistakes, of course. Um, I don't know, in the slight feeling of mob rule that's going around, or is it the quest for new wisdom? It's kind of hard to say at the moment, but nonetheless, he certainly made mistakes about slaves. Um, he famously remarks that uh, slaves have a slavish nature. Um, although he also, a lot of what um, exists of his work was actually notes taken by his students. Um, and there is some debate about this now because one bit of Aristotle's work that actually definitely survives of his is his will, interestingly enough, um, what he left, um, his, the instructions he left when he died. Um, and he was very clear there that he owed a lot to the slaves he did own uh, and freed them at his death. So, um, you know, someone who thought slaves have a slavish nature wouldn't automatically, you think, free them at death. But anyway, I don't particularly want to defend him, but just to kind of give the picture in the round. Um, but um, he also, I think, gives us a real sense of why science is so satisfying. And just this is a final thought from me. Um, science is so satisfying, he thought, because the human mind, maybe not uniquely, maybe we debate that now, um, but nonetheless, the human mind can certainly not just live, sort of, as it were, decide how to feed itself and all those kind of other animal things. Um, it cannot just make choices um, and bring future visions into realization, into manifestation through the imagination. You know, we build cities because we've imagined them first. But most of all, Aristotle thought that studying nature in this way is satisfying because when we do it, we feel our minds, he said, like the gloves fitting onto our fingers, um, our minds sort of fitting with the cosmos, our intelligence seems to resonate and chime with the world around us. And he argued, at least, that's why science isn't just about study, but also quite spontaneously produces wonder, because we get the sense of connection with things, even as we contemplate them. Um, and so he advocated science for that reason as well. And I guess someone like Lucy um, will know about that, because she'll feel uh, the audience's, as well as her own fascination, um, it is partly the communication of facts and the study of what's going on. Um, but there's a huge joy and delight to that as well. So along with the name Aconite, you can also thank Aristotle for a bit of joy and wonder, which we all can experience as we've been we're doing with these tremendous falcons, the peregrine falcons on the spire of the church opposite. And they're also on a wonderful gargoyle there. Mark, thank you so much. Now, I've just got to um, pause everything because we got stuck at 100 participants. So Victoria's just going to upgrade the room. Some of you might remember we had this problem a few weeks ago. Um, so we've got about 100 people waiting outside. Um, so uh, we're going to have to wait two minutes. Have you ever studied peregrine falcons, Lucy? They are tremendous things. No, I, 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 I haven't studied peregrine falcons, but I am a big fan of Aristotle, though. So, I mean, I did really enjoy what you had to say. I've mostly looked at the things that he's got wrong. In, ah. rather than the things he's got right but I didn't know that thing about wonder but I very much agree with that as I, I think that you know you know science is a religion for me for that reason that it, 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 it's, it instills that wonder and that is one of the things that I try and communicate is that is that and it, it does come from that connection that feeling like you're connected to something yeah great. yeah no I love that side of it and um, I mean I feel that a lot of popular science you know when you watch a, a popular science program I mean, I did a physics degree, so I feel this quite a lot with physics. You know, you watch a Horizon program on physics, and you do get a bit of physics, but what you get in bucket loads is wonder. Mm. I always feel it was pure genius that the Hubble Space Telescope has no copyright on its images, so they can be used everywhere. Um, and I'm sure they, you know, it's done them, you know, m more than money could buy, as it were, and by, by giving out their pictures in that way. He was a great man, Aristotle, very great man, a kind of mind boggling to think of how brilliant he was. And I think he did, did he not, was he not on the island of Lesbos was his sort of um, impromptu um, uh, lab where he'd sort of dissect and, you know, cause he was the grandfather of zoology. I mean, he- Yeah, yeah. Yes, I certainly know that he, 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 he was, went into exile twice two islands on the east of Athens, and Lesbos is on the east, isn't it? Mm. So that may, that may well connect. I wasn't quite sure which one it was, but he did suffer a lot from democracy turning against him twice. And really interestingly, actually, given um, the statues that have been pulled down now, there is um, a bit of direct archeological evidence with Aristotle's name written on it, which is very rare for an ancient philosopher. 
And the reason is, is because um, he was once thanked by the city of Athens for work he actually did on the Olympic Games. He sort of mm. tracked the history of the Olympic Games. And in thanks, the city of Athens put a plaque up to him in Delphi. Um, and the plaque survives because about five years later, Athens turned against him and someone grabbed the plaque and threw it down a well. So it sort of smashed in a well, um, which is kind of good for us because we've got a very rare bit of tangible evidence, but it does show the ups and downs of Aristotle's life. And eventually he dies in exile. He goes into exile um, saying um, he wouldn't want democracy to do to him what it already did to its greatest child, Socrates. Um, yeah, so he knew all about it. He, um, one of the things that I, I wrote about in, in my book was that he was, um, what, what I love about him is, is just this idea that he was the first person to sort of consider lots of problems that we take for granted as having been solved now. So um, the issue of migration, birds, where do birds disappear to in the winter? And he was the first person to think about that. Um, and, um, you know, which I just think, just, just, just the, the curiosity just is just so, um, just so wonderful. Anyway, so he, he thought, he noticed the birds disappeared and he's like, where do they go? And he came up with three theories, one of which was migration, which because presumably it seemed so fantastical, the idea of small birds traveling thousands of miles, he, he decided to come up with a couple of bonus theories, one of which was transmutation. He thought that um, he'd noticed that much like Clark Kent and Superman, that Robins and Red Starts were never together at the same time. So oh, he thought okay. that they transmuted from one to the other. And then the other theory he had was um, hibernation, which, which was then debated uh, by the Royal Society, all the way through the Royal, when the Royal Society first formed, that was one of their biggest arguments was whether birds hibernated, in particular, whether swallows hibernated underwater like fish. Yeah, I mean, it, it is fascinating. I love the, I, it makes you I want, you know, um, questions that seem obvious now to us um, and what it actually takes to formulate even the question. I find that very mm -hmm. fascinating. So, yeah. I mean, the, the famous example from another philosopher is Pythagoras. And the story is that he one day walked past the blacksmith, heard the blacksmith beat um, a bar and then when the blacksmith halved the bar, he noticed that the, the note that sounded went up an octave. Um, now, you know, the theory of harmonics and so on comes out of that. But what's so fascinating I find is that presumably, you know, everybody heard that. Everyone heard um, the note leap, but no one quite thought to ask why. Um, yeah. And the consciousness that it takes to do that. And I think it sort of takes what well, sort of, you have to be able to sort of step back a bit from your experience, I think, um, and then reflect on it rather than just kind of be immersed in the experience. So yeah, the, the, the huge shift that it takes to, to ask all these questions that now we kind of take for granted is tremendous. We found a sparrow hawk uh, hanging around in our garden all week. Oh yeah. And it's, it's visited four times today, only managed to get one sparrow. unhappy sparrow. But it, it is amazing. It's just such a stunning thing to see. Oh, yeah. that's a lucky thing, isn't it? That's a lucky lockdown visitation. Yes, it's just, it's exceptional. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy by the, um, the blue tits on my fat balls. I can't even claim to, <laughs> I can't even claim a sparrowhawk in my poultry garden. <laughs> it is costed as a fortune in, in fat balls, uh, peanuts and, and seed, but we've got woodpeckers, um, loads of different sparrows, great tits, blue tits, green things, all sorts of stuff, but I just watched them being eaten. I think <laughs> the thing that secured our garden as the go-to place for goldfinches is um, niger seeds. If you get a niger seed feeder and those niger seeds, they love that. They, they get right onto it and yeah. They're very, they, they're very, they seem very sociable birds. They're constantly chattering to each other. They don't quite have a song, but they kind of chatter away and it, it sounds a bit like, uh, um, you know, sort of tinkling glass somehow um, and you hear them coming so they swoop through the plane trees and then they come down into the garden about half a dozen of them. I'm quite an expert in fact now maybe it could be another another book. <laughs> the philosophy of birds. Yeah well they're, they're very I find them very satisfying because they look slightly exotic I mean we get the parakeets that come screeching by as well that are everywhere um, in London now and you know they're, they're quite sweet actually I've noticed they're quite lovebirds they seem to pair 
and they do seem to look after each other a lot. They preen and I think feed each other and stuff like that. They make um, a lot of noise. They do make a lot of noise. I know that is the downside. Um, but I've half forgiven that um, because of the, the affection they seem to show for each other. Um, but the goldfinches, you know, with this flash of yellow and then the red faces and they seem very exotic, which is rather wonderful. Do you know, the first time we did this meetup, um, there was a huge technology trouble as well. <laughs> and I actually ended up talking for a whole hour. Carry so, on then. <laughs> so Lucy, you know, if you need to reach for, you know, an index or something and prompt a few. <laughs> Mark, I'm reading your secret history of Christianity and it's um, um, up to the ancient Greeks. Just, just started it, I sent for it. It is fabulous. So oh, you can so talk much, about yeah. that for an hour, please. Carry on. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, one, one thing which um, uh, I do talk a bit about in that book is the, the shift of consciousness that I think, yes. um, it, you know, it, it took for people like Aristotle then to start asking all these questions that presumably were around before, but no one thought to ask them. My favourite example, actually, is um, there's one of the pre-Socratics called Examines, and he um, blew on his hand in two ways. He blew on his hand, first of all, with his lips pursed, and then with his mouth wide open like that. And again, he noticed something which presumably countless people before had experienced, which is when your mouth is open, it's warm. And when your lips are pursed, it's cold. But he thought to ask why. Um, and he sort of came up with the right answer as well. He realized that when air expands, it cools. Um, but what was fascinating too was that he didn't then sort of turn that into a mini industry and build the first fridges um, or air conditioning, you know, which might have been quite a good thing to do in ancient Athens. Um, but he was remembered for his amazing mind and um, that he people would sort of meet him and I think wonder quite what thought they might have by his presence um, because he was known to kind of ask these kind of wide ball questions and there's still I think there's still quite a lot of the thrill of that you know if you meet someone who has a different take on life or who mm. asks things in a different way um, I mean it can clearly can progress knowledge but it can be quite um, enlivening as well. You kind of want, wonder what they're going to come up with and, and do so again. And it gives you ways to think yourself that maybe you haven't thought, maybe it's in the back of your mind, but you've never brought it forward. And you, things like you've just said, you, you, something is said and you think, I would never ever have brought that to the fore of my mind. And there it is as plain as daylight. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for ch chatting, Julia. I got to get a plug for the book and something to talk about for another five minutes. Yes. No, no, <laughs> I, I, I truly, really, and I've ordered two more copies to give to some friends. One is an Orthodox Jewish person who I know will love it, and another one is a friend. So I, I didn't want to part with mine when I finished it, so I've ordered two oh. more. We should just confirm that we've never met before. No, we have never met before. <laughs> and you didn't pay me. <laughs> No, we've never met before. Never. Yeah. Um, They're waiting to get everybody in. I mean, the other thing about it, of course, is that it does disturb people when people ask different questions. I mean, it's no small thing that Aristotle, you know, was expelled from, well, ran away sort of fearing the mob from Athens. Mm -hmm. He upset people. Socrates, of course, eventually gets killed by the democracy, basically because he upset people too much. Um, and there was there were there were periods of book burning and stuff like that is thought now in ancient mm. Athens as well, um, partly because for a lot of the time they were at war with other city states, famously the Peloponnesian War. Mm. Um, but then, of course, um, uh, Alexander the Great comes around smashing everything up, um, and Aristotle, because he was the teacher of Alexander, got rather um, accused by association, um, which is partly why he got into trouble. But what we would they with Twitter? Aristotle. Yeah, Ed, the lot of them. What would they, how would they cope with Twitter when you say they're running away from the mob because they're you know, afraid of what's going to happen, burning books? Look, looking at today, how yeah. do you think they would have reacted to Twitter? Well, in some ways, you know, they, in a way they didn't need it because you know, a large city-state was only maybe 100,000 people, like Athens. And whilst they were very divided societies, um, people would know each other quite well, I think. Um, you know, certainly I think all the free men would know all the free men. Mm -hmm. I think all the women would know many of the women um, because people lived in what was, what's now called homosocial cultures. Um, 
but because there weren't that many, you'd either know them directly or know of them. And so, you know, word would spread like wildfire, I think, in, you know, in, in a city which you could walk across in just 15 or 20 minutes mm. and where you, you, you spend a lot of your life. Um, there was no sense of privacy, I don't think, in the modern way. You know, you, you would sort of end eating groups, sleeping groups. Um, it was all done very collectively. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so I, get, I guess things... Um, I mean, Socrates was known, first of all, the first rumour that we have of him, one was he was uh, very brave in the Peloponnesian War, but then also he was known for not wearing shoes. If you'd gone around Athens and asked, you know, what do you know about Socrates, they wouldn't have said some great highfalutin theory. And um, mm -hmm. they would have said, he, isn't he the chap that doesn't wear shoes? <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, you know, in some ways, Twitter takes, maybe takes us back um, as, as much as does something new. Mark, can I come in here? Yeah, no, please, Sandy. <laughs> uh, because just, it, just to pick up on that point, I'm a musician, everyone, if you're not familiar, and um, I've done an introduction to jazz course, which I'm going to be talking about briefly a little bit later on. But it's very interesting to, to hear what you say about the way of learning. We might think of the ancient Greeks as being incredibly, um, uh, you know, having kind of formal type of learning, whereas what you're saying is very spontaneous. I mean, New Orleans is the birthplace of jazz, and... The New Orleans jazz musicians, I mean, some of them were very tutored, but others learned on the streets. Sidney Bechet and his brother were, spent 10, 12 hours a day sitting on the sidewalk, working things out very slowly. And it was a very, very public arena, uh, rather than going to a conservatoire. Right, yeah. Um, so this was music that, it was a, it was a, well, it was an intellectual discipline that everybody owned, I think. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. I mean, well, the, the Aristotelians were known as the peripatetics because they walked around everywhere. Um, they certainly thought that you've got to be kind of out and about. I mean, maybe that connects to the interest in, in the sciences, actually. The observation was a key thing. So, um, I mean, sometimes it, they are contrasted with the Platonists who are said to be the armchair philosophers. Um, I think that's a bit harsh, actually, myself, because the Platonist schools were known for their observations of the skies, for example. Um, so they certainly were into observation as well. Do you and think both schools complemented each other? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's the case. Yeah. I mean, you know, Aristotle was Plato's student for 25 years before he sets up his own school. So he wasn't just uh, walking off in a huff and saying, no, you've got to do it this way. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Lucy, do you want to say something about what you might have said anyway, <laughs> just in case the clock ticks down? Okay. Um, I mean, right, I, 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 I heard that you're, you. Um, you know, you'd be working on things um and the lockdown has um, meant that they've got pushed back a bit but it sounded a pretty neat idea yeah i've been well i did i i i i my, I'm, I'm i'm basically uh, in, i was in lockdown anyway because i'm writing a book so you know what that's like it's just um so it was it, you know i sort of felt like it was quite convenient actually that the world joined me on a writer's retreat and then suddenly ways to sort of make my solitary life more um more jolly like you know idler chats on a thursday night were suddenly beamed onto my computer um but i, I have to say i found it hard to concentrate uh, I'm, I'm all right i'm back all right again now but i did find it quite hard to start off with it was quite sort of um challenging but i've been working on a new book which is called um bitch the female of the species which is all about how female animals were marginalized and misunderstood um by science starting with darwin <laughs> oh really uh, yeah yeah now that sounds big to, to mm. say he's a bit of a culprit yeah so um so yeah well basically um you know darwin was a brilliant and uh you know meticulous scientist but he was also a man of his time and that time was the victorian era and so it meant that he there was a lot of prejudice written into his not not in his first not in his most famous work not in the origin of spe the species but in um his sort of second great theoretical work which was um um the, his book his theory of sexual selection so which which attempted to describe why the sexes are different and and how they behave and um he claimed that females were passive and coy and males were ardent and because he said that then for and because he was such a brilliant man and he carried such a lot of weight that's then what people believed and so if anybody um saw you know 
some licentious promiscuity of the lioness, for example, who'll, you know, mate hundreds of times during oestrus, um, then they just sort of ignored it and just pretended it didn't happen, you know. And, and so there was a lot of um, confirmation bias going on for a long time. Um, and really, it took a it, it took a bunch of feminist, really cool feminist scientists in the States, actually, um, to start going, hang on a second, females aren't like that, you know, and and they, uh, they, they've undergone a, lo a lot of resistance for what they've had to say. They've been joined by many others. And, um, and it's interesting what you're saying about book burning and all that and people not liking new ideas. But so um, Darwin's whole idea that um, females were coy and males were ardent, um, that was then proved in the 1940s by a chap called Angus John Bateman, who was a geneticist, who did an experiment with mutant fruit flies that proved Darwin was right and proved that um, females gain nothing by mating with multiple partners and males have everything to gain. And the, the, and, and this was based on what was called anisogamy, which is the difference, the fundamental difference in our sex cells. So sperm are small and plentiful, and so males will be promiscuous and want to sow their seed, whereas females, um, their eggs are large and expensive, and so um, they'll be chaste and choosy. And that rule, I was taught that at Oxford, that, that, was, that was taught to me, and you know, that is seeped out of science into popular culture. I mean, it is something that a lot of people will say, well, that's, that's just the way that it is. And it just isn't the way that it is. It, it isn't at all. You know, I mean, there, there are females that are choosy. The pronghorn antelope, for example, is one of the few that will, you know, choose one male who is the fastest and, and mate with him once. And that's it, you know. But many, many other animals behave very, female animals behave very differently. And not just in terms of their sexuality, but also, you know, females are, you know, that there is this sort of idea that patriarchy is the norm, you know, that, that males are always bigger, that they're always in charge. Um, and that's also not true. So that's what my book is going through and pulling apart a lot of the preconceptions we have about the sexes. Yes, it's, it's, can I, um, Mark, can oh, I just yeah, come in, um, yeah. just an update on our technical stuff? So thank, thanks so much for um, rambling away. But now I'm, I'm going to be asking you the same questions probably that Mark asked you. Um, but I think we're getting a little bit of a influx of a few new people. Um, so, Lucy, I'm going to sort of like rewind about ten or fifteen minutes, if that's okay, everyone, and we'll go okay. on to the, we'll go on to about six fifteen. So, people who've just arrived. Um, you're not going to miss anything because we were just sort of sorting stuff out. Uh, and before we talk to you, Lucy, I just wanted to say thank you to the Popcos, the Popcos of California. Um, are the Popcos in the room? If so, could they make themselves known? Uh, the Popcos have sent us this lovely postcard um, and uh, saying thank you for the Zooms. But what's good about them is that they're in San Francisco. They're not like round the corner. Um, and uh, it's really nice of them to send in an actual postcard to say how much they're enjoying these things with this rather lovely American stamp. So thanks for that. Send us in your postcards in the future. Um, now, most of you uh, have been listening to Lucy. I think we've still got a few more people popping in. If you have just popped in, hello, welcome to the Idler, a drink with the Idler. We've got Lucy Cook here. Say hello, Lucy. Hello. Lucy is the famous uh, zoologist and... Um, uh, and, 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 and well-known wit, uh, formerly based in London, but now you've moved to Hastings. Um, I'll just do a very, very quick uh, biography because you've been on telly loads. You wrote a really fantastic book called The Unexpected Truth About Animals. But we first met you, Lucy, and you've got a new one coming out, which I know you've been talking about with Mark. We'll talk about that again. Um, we first met you at Port Elliot Festival, I think, many years ago, although we have got mutual yeah. friends. Yeah. yeah, when you were dressed up as the frog. Um, but you, you sort of dropped frogs and went on to sloths. What was the story there? Well, I haven't dropped frogs. Yeah, you have. You don't like frogs anymore. I... But... Well, well, I haven't. I, I, I didn't drop frogs. I just got, you know, they, they just basically got wrestled to the ground by the sloths, basically. So, um, yeah. 
No, I, I spent six months traveling around South America trying to raise awareness about the plight of, of global plight of amphibians and called myself the Amphibian Avenger. And that's why I was at Fort Elliott wearing a frog yeah, mask. Yeah, that's right. Cape. Yeah. And yeah. But that, um, that, I mean, that, that went quite well. I mean, you did raise some awareness there, but um, I suppose arguably you've done more for the sloth. And with this really, such a funny piece, which I was reading again today, we put it back on the website that you did for the Idler in 2014, I think, um, about the sloth and defending him and saying that, uh, you know, naturalists over the years have put the sloth down, but he's actually a very advanced creature. Um, and interestingly, you, you sort of have a bit of a go at koalas. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's the thing is everybody, um, you know, everybody thinks koalas are really cute, but, um, you know, they're actually really cantankerous. Um, uh, every time I've met a, a koala, it's been extremely bad tempered and um, quite uh, vicious or, or just zonked out. Um, they're very similar, actually, because they both live, both koalas and, and sloths live on toxic leaves, um, which is the reason why sloths are so slow is because their diet is toxic and so they have to have a very slow metabolism and digest their food very slowly otherwise their liver wouldn't cope and it would they poison themselves so so because of their diets they've they they they've evolved to be very slow and they have you know this sort of incredible adaptations to basically burning as little energy as possible so my whole thing is, is that everybody derides them because they think that because they're slow, they're somehow second rate because we're obsessed with speed and going faster than nature intended. But actually, sloths are incredibly successful. They've been around in one shape or another for 60 million years, precisely because they're so, because they are slow and because they're so good at saving energy. And so, I mean, for instance, by, by hanging upside down, the only muscles that need to work are the ones that work that actually grip onto the branches. And so, you know, when, when I'm sort of, you know, sitting even in this chair, I've got muscles that are having to work to do that. But sloths, when they're relaxing, they don't have to do that because they're just dangling like a happy hairy hammock from a tree. <laughs> and um, so they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, I, I, you know, I still believe and I feel like the sloth's time, you know, I've, I've, been, I've been banging the sloth drum for a long time, as you know, yeah. but they are energy saving icons and they really should be, you know, our sort of aspirational animal in these times of, you know, when we should be spending less energy. You know, they are the, you know, they should be the animal icon of the green movement, really. Because they're the original tree hugger, you know? Uh, but particularly now, you know, um, lockdown. I mean, sloths would, would have been delighted by lockdown, I guess. There, there, there's a sort of, I guess it looks yeah, like an 18th, 18th now. century. We're yeah, all sloths now. We, now what about uh, you in your own, your own life? Um, you've recently moved out of London uh, and you're now living in Hastings. And yeah. what prompted that move? Because you must have been living in London for, I don't know, 20, 25 years or something. Um, why do you want to move to Hastings? And what's that, that, what's that been like? Well, I just, um, you know, I, I just, uh, I, I wanted to kind of, it's, it's not an obvious place for a zoologist to live, London, you know? I mean, there's not a lot of animal life there. And so I did want to be near a nature. Um, and... So, but I sort of moved here by accident. I didn't intend to completely move here, but it's just so lovely. It, what, what, you, you feel when you live in London, it's so addictive, the treadmill and the whole energy and excitement and oh, all of this stuff. And then when you move out of London and you really don't miss it very much at all, you know, and actually it's just a lot more relaxing and, and, and I, 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 you know, I'm, as a lot of people know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm quite a sort of busy character. And uh, it's always been slightly ironic that I've championed the sloth. And I have always, you know, literally my New Year's resolution every year is to be more like a sloth because I think it would be good for me. <laughs> and, and, now, and now you're actually really doing it. That's great. Part of that mission to be more sloth-like. And, yeah. and it's worked. It has, it, it definitely, you know, when you step off the train and you see the change in light and, you know, your friends are texting you from the beach. <laughs> Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it, it's harder to be as um, obsessed with work. With work and status and competition and those sorts of things. Yeah, and those things, they're just not, you know, I mean, it's good to be engaged. It's good to be doing something that you're passionate about. Um, but, you know, there is, um, you know, there's too much of that, you know. And, and ironically, see, I've moved to the, the country and now you've moved to London. You're, <laughs> yeah. you're 
actually a sloth in reverse. Yeah, yeah. I know. Um, I, I'm now a cheetah or something like you that. You are, yeah. But ready to tear apart the competition of other small magazines. <laughs> yeah. Rip them apart um, and accelerate over them and destroy them. Yeah. That's what we're doing now. That's okay for a bit. Lucy, what about zoos? I've, I've read in The Guardian, I think, that, you know, zoos are under threat because of lockdown. Mm. Is that the case? And I mean, I also read that the animals like, you know, being visited. Yeah, well, I think it's bloody boring being in a zoo if you're an animal, isn't it? You know, so I probably do quite enjoy being visited. Um, what do you um, think of zoos in general? I mean, are, are zoos good things or bad things? It's difficult, really. I think it's a matter of animal size. I think if you're, in, if, I think if you're a snake or an amphibian um, or, or even, you know, even a meerkat, you know, it's like it's not that much of a problem being in a zoo. But if you're a gorilla um, or, you know, something large that, that with a rich social life that has a large range in the wild, I, I think it's tricky. You know, I mean, I, I do understand that they that they do a lot of you know, for a lot of people, zoos are the first port. They, they engage people in the natural world and make people excited about animals. Well, that's what I'm thinking because you know, we, we obviously we have Regent's Park Zoo in London, which is um, you know, it's a lovely institution, and I'd, I'd be a little sad to see it go. It, it, mm. did, could it ever go? Do you think? Uh, I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't know enough about the economics of how much they need people to come through. I mean, I, they must be very, very expensive to run. I, I can imagine, but. Um, you know, I think that um, what, what, what is awful, though, are those all those unregulated zoos, which you particularly get in the States. And there was a, at the start of lockdown. Everybody was watching Tiger. Um, what was it? Tiger, Tiger King. King. Yeah. Tiger yeah. King. Yeah. yeah. Those lunatics with the uh, keeping big cats. Yeah, and there's a lot, and there's a lot of that that goes on, and and that is obviously just appalling, and should be stopped because they're not. It's not about the animals; it's all about ego and showing off, and people wanting to. I mean, it's it's it, you know, it's a sanctioned menagerie basically with somebody who's got ideas of you know controlling nature or you know being having you know ruling over nature and 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 having their own menagerie so yeah they're, they're um, in, it's like sort of that kind of fantasy of man subduing nature yeah i mean the interesting that there's and, and that is a very popular fantasy that goes with powerful people who are attracted to power because um, pablo escobar was a um had a menagerie in in colombia and and which i i the, i visited the remnants of it um several years ago because the hippos that he, 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 so he, 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 you know, at the height of his, when he was like on the Forbes top 10 richest men of the world. And, mm. you know, he, he, he had this, he gathered this menagerie in, in, um, in the Andes near, in between Bogota and Medellin on his ranch. And he had all sorts of, you know, crazy animals, but he, he imported four hippos, one male and three females. And they bred like rabbits. They loved Colombia, and then now there's like 80 of them because basically when when Escobar was dispatched, his animals were all repatriated into sort of zoos and private collections around South America. But hippos are sort of hard to relocate, <laughs> and so the hippos stayed in the pond outside his house and bred like rabbits. And and basically, yeah, they're now this sort of massive problem because. What happens is with, with hippos is you have a male hippo who has his harem and whenever his sons reach sexual maturity, he boots them out of the, um, out of the family pod because they're gonna compete with him um, and, um, and that's not acceptable. So they head off, um, you know, so these hippos head off in the, the South in the Colombian rivers looking for, for hippo love elsewhere, you know, these young randy young males. I mean, the problem is that's completely normal if you're in Africa, but if you're in Colombia, there are no hippos out there. There's no, there's no romance to be found for a lonely male hippo. And so they, they literally, they're like rocking up in these, you know, hundreds of miles away, a, 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 an aggressive and they're very aggressive creatures, large male hippo will, who's, who's desperate for sex will turn up. I found one uh, that we filmed was um, next to a kindergarten and these kids, we're like, yeah, we can't swim in the pond anymore. Like, no, you can't. Um, and, um, and one of them told me that his grandmother was chased for an hour 
the previous day by this by this this angry Randy hippo. So they've got this sort of issue with, um, and then they, and then to the, what I was one of the stories that I wrote about for my book because it was just so amazing. So they have got this problem. They got these hippos running riot all over Colombia, and um, be, you know they're an invasive species, right? And so normally with an invasive species, you just kill them. So like if rats are invasive or cockroaches or whatever, you know they just get rid of them. There's been some extraordinary elaborate. Um, means of trying to exterminate invasive species. There was a, in Guam, they had, um, a, they were overrun with brown, um, brown snakes. And so they dropped cats from, from, from airplanes and parachutes. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why they had to do the parachute thing, but I don't know, like, I, but anyway, they just jazzed it up a bit. Do you know what I mean? But anyway, so, so anyway, so the problem with it, so, so basically, but you can't shoot hippos. They shot one hippo and everybody was up in arms because hippos are in Disney movies. And so you can't, you know, you can't, you can't do that. And Colombia has got this, obviously this, this, you know, image of being violent and whatever. So it's really, they're trying to sort of rebrand themselves. They can't be killing hippos. So <laughs> they took, they went for plan B, which is castrates the hippos. And I met this, <laughs> I met this vet who, who had some serious cojones himself because his job was to go and castrate the wild rogue male hippos. I am literally, I am not making this up. This is what his job was. Now, your mission, Carlos Valderrama, is <laughs> to go and, anyway, so he managed to do one. He managed to castrate one male hippo. He told me it took six hours. It was really, 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 really difficult, Lucy. I tell you, it was really hard. Um, and really hard because basically, um, First of all, I mean, really aggressive hippos. I mean, I'm like, but allegedly the most dangerous animal in Africa. You don't include the mosquito, and um, and and basically, um, you, you, but they're also because they're hard, huge amount of fat. You've got to be really careful with with how much um, 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 uh, um, anaesthetic you give them because and the anaesthetic dissolves in fat. So you don't want to fall asleep in the water and accidentally drown. You know, so it's like really hard to sort of get that right. Plus the fact they've got like you know, skin this thick and then like this much fat underneath. Anyway, he ma eventually manages to an anesthetize one. And then you won't believe it, the testicles are internal, right? Because believe it or not, hippos, closest relatives, not pigs, not horses, they're whales. They're most closely related to <laughs> whales, right? So their testicles are internal, streamlined, you know, not dangling and bobbing around. Hence, like hence, hence the difficulty in castrating them then. Really, really hard. Yeah. Plus, he said that they do this strange thing where they, they're known to wander when under attack. Anyway, so he said it took like hours just to sort of locate, and they're the size of a cantaloupe, but nevertheless, trying to locate <laughs> them and actually then remove them took a very long time and um so and it cost a hundred thousand dollars and so that yeah that basically the hippo problem exists yeah. and, yeah, and yeah, what yeah, will happen yeah. is that they'll become have, a new species if they had access to the cocaine millions i mean maybe they could go back into cocaine dealing they could pay for some of these operations <laughs> exactly yeah uh, lucy um in unexpected truth about animals uh what i remember is being quite striking is that you you're quite hostile to penguins um mm. and also you talk quite interestingly about beavers uh, and i think beavers have some uh i think the, the beaver's testicle was prized by by someone at some point is oh, that I true i should have brought my beaver i knew you were going to ask about beavers my, <laughs> my beaver glands are upstairs <laughs> like i could go and get them yes yeah, so so basically beavers well, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to try and see if I can get them for us. Oh, that'd be great. You know, and then, have, like, I'm going on the move. Have, 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 you, have, have you met COVID, your dog? No, you can't do everything. You can't, I can't retrieve beaver glands and show the dog all at the same time. No, okay, so sorry. I'm just going to have to just go. There are limits to your abilities. Here, here are the beaver glands. So, okay, so yeah, I was these. Ooh. These are beaver's anal glands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the anal gland, not the testicle. Sorry, I got that yeah, wrong. No, yeah, no, no, but that's the thing. But look, they look like testicles, right? So the ancients, um, the, the writers of the beasties, there was this legend that they were, that these were te beaver's testicles. They're not actually, they're anal glands. And these were a cure for hysteria in women. So very, very, so basically beavers were hunted to extinction, not because of their coats. In America, they were hunted to extinction for their coats, but in Europe they were hunted to extinction for these. For their for anal their, glands. 
for their anal glands, which you might think, oh, what's Lucy doing with a pair of beaver anal glands um, in her office and, and sniffing them? You know, but actually the thing about them, the reason why they were- How, how, old, are, how old are those anal glands? I mean, are they from like the 18th century or something? No, these were harvested in 2004, apparently. Who, who was it who first sort of- I bought them on, on eBay. But who, 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 who was the first guy to nibble on a beaver's anal gland and then find out that it uh, cured his hysteria and then decided to give it to a, a, a woman? Well, basically, they don't, they don't cure hysteria. They just basically, the, you, know, there's a, you know, as there always is with folk medicine, if it looks a bit like something, then it cures. Like rhino horn is a cure for... Um, impotence. Impotence. You know, of course it's yeah. not. So these were a cure for hysteria because obviously what every hysterical woman needs is a pair of balls and then they'll actually be all right, you know. Yeah. So, so but what's really interesting is what I found when I was writing the book is the sort of grains of truth that exist in these old myths. And actually the fascinating thing about beaver anal glands is they're actually um, where the beaver itself sequesters toxins from the plants that it eats and then they, they end up in, in, the, in their anal glands as this liquid called castorium, which they use to scent mark, and is actually incredibly fragrant. These, these smell like um, incense, believe it or really? not. Yeah, they don't smell like they live near the animal's refuse chute in any way, shape, or form. What do, what do beavers eat? Uh, what, what's a beaver's diet? Is it something like well, they're, know, they're do they eat coriander and peas? Yeah, so they're vegetarians, and so, you know, and there's a lot of um, medicinal properties actually in these because um, one of the beaver's favorite foods is willow and willow um, salicylic acid is part of willow, which is aspirin. Which, which is, is aspirin, yeah. yeah. So uh, I wow. I actually thought I'd give it a whirl. You know, I thought, oh, well, you know, like, you know. Well, to, to cure your hysteria or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, I'd try anything. Do you know what I mean? I was writing the last <laughs> book, I was feeling pretty hysterical. So. I thought I'd have a nibble and um, these here glands and um, I, I just, I really don't recommend it actually because it, um, it, it just, it made me um, uh, sort of belch these sort of woody belchy and then I, and then I had like this terrible smell, like it was coming out of every pore Ooh, dear. and, 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 and uh, it made me feel more than a little hysterical, ironically. So um, yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't recommend it, but in theory, and then I spoke to a, 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 a chemist type and they said I'd have to eat both sacks to get rid of a headache. And I was like, fuck that. No. <laughs> <laughs> now what about penguins? Cause they came, they come in for a bit of a bashing in the unexpected truth about animals. Penguins. Penguins yeah. do, yeah. Well, I mean, everybody thinks that they're cute because they can't walk on land. They're, 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 if, if we knew penguins in their underwater guys, we'd think of them completely differently because underwater they're like torpedoes and they're really incredibly fast, efficient killers. But on land, because they're designed, because they're basically birds that want to be fish, they're not well suited to being on land and they can't walk properly. Because they can't walk properly, they trigger our nurturing instinct because they wobble like toddlers. So, um, so we think that they're adorable and they can do no wrong. And, you know, I mean, you know, they're just there. And, but unfortunately they, they have some rather, you know, unpalatable for, for, for most human taste um, habits in that they are, you know, the males will basically have sex with anything that moves and, you know, quite a few things that don't move, like um, dead penguins, for example, because they they basically, they, they, this is the ones that are in the South, basically penguin divorce rates, you find penguins all the way from the South Pole to the equator, in fact, um, and penguin, you know, the idea that penguins are monogamous is complete rubbish, they're not at all, that some of them are monogamous for a season, but most of them you know, will have sex with anything that moves because it's pretty desperate being a penguin. You know, I mean, well, you why is it so desperate? Arctic, it's really. I, I I do feel sorry for them. I mean, they they just have this sort of flat surface, and that seems to be about it. There's no um, there's no like rides or anything, or uh, they they don't seem to have any hobbies. No, no, regurgitating fish probably is their only hobby it looks like a, a, a sort of vast prison like a prison yard doesn't it where they live yeah yeah i, I you know but the, 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 was re what was really what, what what i just found amazingly funny um was the sort of catastrophic disenchantment of the first man to discover that penguins were not 
love, lovable little, oh, little children. And, you know, he's this guy called George Murray Levick, who is part of Scott's Antarctic mission. And he was the first person to ever document penguin behavior for a whole season. He sat with these penguins his, in his diaries. It starts off and he's like, oh, look at them. They're like little people. They're so cute. And then he's like, oh my God, these gangs of hooligan cocks whose passions have gone beyond their control. And he's just completely horrified. And then he becomes so horrified that he starts encoding their worst behavior in Greek in his notes. So that <laughs> just in case... Even though he's there on a solo mission, just in case somebody else were to, were to, were to his, his notes were to fall into the wrong hands. And in, 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 case the, in case the notes fell into the hands of the ladies in the drawing room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, which would be completely appalling. And, um, and then when he delivered his, um, you know, he'd, he'd spent a whole, um, you know, two months observing their behaviour. And it was this sort of landmark study nobody had ever done with that with penguins. And the Natural History Museum published his findings with the, with the, you know, the, you know, the life and times of the Adelie penguin, but their sexual habits, that chapter was not allowed to be published. And it was actually published, it was actually distributed privately as this sort of under the counter private penguin porno, which detailed the really sort of outrageous exploits of the penguins because it wasn't, society couldn't cope with it, you know. And it was only, it was completely lost to science and found only by accident by this amazing researcher at the Natural History Museum about five years ago, who was researching Scott. Yeah, um, so, so it was, it was, it's been up to you to really um, lay bare these habits in your, in, in your book. Oh, yeah. Now, what about the new one? Uh, that's, it's called Bitch. Yeah, Bitch. Uh, bitch. Yeah. Um, and what's the subtitle? What's it all about? The female of the species. So, you know, I, I did do a little bit about this. You were, you, I don't know, you were way fixing technical issues. Um, but, okay, yeah. But, so I, I did go into it a bit. So I'm basically, yes, yeah, so it's about, the, uh, it's, a, it, it's, you know, in the way that the unexpected truth about animals was about the mis mistakes and misconceptions we have about all animals, this is more sort of a really just sort of fine tuned about how we've misunderstood female animals throughout, throughout the time, throughout. And so and that, that's what you're going to be working on for, well, for quite a while, because the book doesn't come out until the year after next. Is that right? Yeah, no, I know. I'm, I'm basically, it's, it's just, it's a massive, massive, mass. It's, this is actually like a, this is a proper uh, piece of academic work. <laughs> Yeah. I didn't realise it was going to be when I started it. But um, so, um, yeah, it's just taking, it's a lot of research. It's going to be amazing and controversial and ruffle some feathers and wow. some minds. Um, but it's not going to be out until um, February 22. Yeah, but what a, what a great project to be immersed in for the next, you know, 18 months or so. It's fantastic. Yeah, no, I'm, I feel, I mean, I'm, you know, I feel like I'm one of the lucky ones because I, you know, I've, I've, I've had a project during all of this, you know, I found it difficult to concentrate during, during the, the beginning of it all, but, um, but now, you know, yeah, I'm lucky, you know. Well, uh, Lucy, can we, uh, Victoria and Mark, um, well, Lucy, thanks so much. Let's have a Pleasure. quick un unmute and a, a round of applause. <laughs> Are we unmuting? Is, is Victoria in the room again? Um, and uh, Mark, can we have a bit of brief, hi to you, Matt, can we have a bit of brief philosophy? And then um, I think we've got a few questions lined up. Uh, yeah, I, I'm actually going to suggest that, that we have a bit of brief music because we had quite a lot of philosophy, as it turned out. Maybe oh. um, San would Sandy like to say something? Oh, Sandy. Um, sorry, where are you? Uh, I think I'm here. Oh, Sandy. Look, I'm so sorry about these, these technical problems. Um, no, don't worry. Now, you, uh, everybody, this it's is It's been Sandy. a very informative hour. <laughs> yeah, it's been good. I'm sorry for everyone who's got to go, but we're, we're, we, we had a sort of 10 or 15 minute gap in the middle. Um, now, Sandy, let me introduce you to everyone. If, if we did, we, if, I, I now forget whether we introduced you in the, in the first place. I can't remember now. Yeah, well, I don't um, know. Everybody. Happy to be um, reintroduced. This is Sandy uh, and everybody who, who came in late. Um, Sandy Burnett, he's written our book for the Idol about classical music and presented our online course on classical music and jazz for which he assembled a live band. Um, he's spoken at festivals. A lot of you may have read his work. Uh, he's been a DJ on Radio 3. He's a musician. Um, and what else have you been up to, Sandy? And, and what, what, what would you like to talk about? Have you got some well, musical themes for us? Well, it's just that you wanted me to come and talk about the, the, the Guide to Jazz, which is the online course, which is uh, a feature course this week. And um, you and Victoria had asked me for um, 
for actually quite a few years after I made my classical music course to come back and do something about jazz because I am a, I'm, I'm amphibious, to use a zoological term. Like a frog. Of, well, I'm yeah, very much like a frog, but in terms of being able to work in the classical field and the jazz fields, which is relatively unusual. But I thought, because actually you had a friend um, who was related to the, to the Idler family, uh, Dave Hamlet, a very fine drummer. And I said, I w I'd love to do this course, but only if I could have a live band to illustrate examples. So Dave got a very fine band together and that's the Idler Quint Quintet. So we formulated this course. Uh, I mean, jazz is just over a, a, a century old. And it's, a, it's a, an American art form. It's the greatest American art form really of the invented in the 20th century because it encapsulates the art of improvisation, which is, and that's something we've, we've lost in many ways in other art music forms. But improvisation is, gives performers the voice of freedom. So it's incredibly important. Uh, the second very obvious thing to say about jazz is it's, it's incredibly interesting from the social point of view. It's a, it's, a, it's a musical medium born, not entirely, but largely by black people in New Orleans. And the development of jazz over the decades, developments with the you know, developments in human rights and uh, freedom and equality and that kind of thing, particularly important at the moment. But actually that was, a, that was an angle on jazz that I didn't set out to address. My main thing as a musician is how do I encourage people to listen to music? How can I make people listen to music in a different way? And in the classical course, that's, uh, that's what I did from beginning to end, a thousand years of classical music. And here with a hundred years of jazz, we talked about it together and we thought the best way of proceeding was to proceed decade by decade. So uh, there's music of the 1920s, incredibly fertile um, age. And of course we can illustrate the examples because the recording era had just begun then. In fact, the first jazz recording was made in uh, February 1917 by the original Dixieland Jazz Band. And then when we move from the 1930s onwards, decade by decade, the Idler Quintet, this band that I mentioned, we got together and we play one uh, example from each decade. Uh, for example, the 1930s, it's Lester Leaps In, uh, which is a Lester Young tune, and we play it, and before it and after it, I explain what decisions we made, how, how we approach the tune and what's going on. Because the 1930s, for example, is, is the swing era. So music was very uh, smooth, in terms of, like Glenn Miller and um, Count Basie. Um, it wasn't so much jazz with rough edges, it was very much uh, swing with a very smooth down. And then just a decade after that, we we're into the era of bebop, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis. Uh, so jazz becomes a very intellectual movement. So again, we illustrate with uh, Donna Lee, which is um, a tune written by Miles Davis and uh, on we go. So yeah, so it's, if you want to find out how to listen to jazz with live examples and suggested listening and reading, I think this course might be of interest. Thanks, Andrew. Have, have we got anything lined up to play now? Uh, not in my hands. No, we're, we were sort of vaguely thinking of that. Cause it's quite nice to have a, a, a tune at the end. Yeah, it might be. Yeah, but um, um, well, I don't have anything in my pockets. But present. Sandy, th thanks so much. Can everyone check out Sandy's stuff? It's absolutely brilliant. Um, and I'm just remembering some other things I was supposed to do. Uh, there's a new issue of the magazine. Uh, by the way, sorry, I meant to say Sandy and Mark have columns in in the Idler. Oh. Um, and I think your uh, essay is about the tambourine, Sandy. It is. In this issue. Central New Orleans instrument. Yeah, it's it. a very interesting subject, the tambourine. <laughs> um, much harder to play than than it might than than you might think. Is that right? Yeah, that's the case with all percussion instruments. It looks easy, but it's very hard to control. Indeed, it looks easy and it's hard to control. Um, <laughs> um, so that's the new issue. We literally just got it back from the printer today uh, and that's going off in the post today to subscribers.